recruitment and training program. In 2017, though he doesn't look old enough, he took on the challenge of leading his own sales team in the high-performing Barfoot and Thompson's Green Lane office, achieving remarkable success. Today, David is committed to helping others grow in the real estate industry and to make a positive difference for individuals, teams, and companies alike. We are delighted to welcome David Polk. Thank you. Delighted to be here, actually, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you a bit of a story. Take you along uh, my journey in real estate, and it was interesting in preparing for today's session, uh, a couple of kind of objectives strategically uh, in the background, but I really thought as well as I was getting ready for it, my goodness, these are things that I've learned over the years that I wish I'd known earlier in my career. And so in a way, whilst I look up to many of you, and I just want to give you a bit of an insight into the way that I work. So um, can I just have a bit of a show of hands? Who's, who is in the industry less than two years? Hands up if you've been in the business less than two years. Well, I'm not even the Well done, good to be here. <laughs> Um, by the way, I often get asked, what, you know, when's the best time to start in real estate? And I've actually been chatting to the uh, Chief Data Science at Ryan's, and I don't know if we'll embark down this body of work or not, but he said it would be fascinating to work out whether people have a better career in real estate if they start in a tough market, mm -hmm. or whether they start in a hot market. And I said, mm, that would be interesting. I reckon those who start in this kind of market are the ones who develop best practice and know how to work, they get the foundation right, and you know what, when things change, all of a sudden they feel like they've got a tailwind and they're soaring, and if things go back to normal, that's when those agents go, I don't know how to handle this. So you know, great time to start from my perspective. Um, by the way, I wasn't as lucky as you to start at that time, I started in 2005. I, I want to take you a little bit on that journey as promised. So, uh, I, I'll give you a little snippet. So in 2004, I was 17, I was working three jobs. Uh, I was homeschooled, so slightly unusual. And those of you who get to know me, like many of you, I'm sure, we all have our quirks. Uh, and it's funny the things that make you who you are, and certainly at that age, you don't even really know that. But uh, I, I, I backtracked to that time where I'm at the barbecues and my dad's work too. By the way, both of my parents are scientists. My dad is actually still working at Fonterra Research Centre. He's been there over 35 years. He's the senior research technologist and a world expert in anhydrous milk fat. So there you go. Uh, love him, Dad, uh, by the way. A real good man. And so is my mum. Uh, she, um, the reason why I tell you this is you can imagine I'm 17 and I decide I want to get into real estate. The scientists, you know, go to university, do your masters, etc., etc. Uh, so my first sales job, well, actually it wasn't my first sales job, but it was probably the most difficult one, was convincing them that it was a good decision to get into real estate. Um, can I ask, when you got into real estate, what was your perception of the industry? Before you got into it, what was your perception of the industry? Talk to me guys. Uh, so me, can I just say, very quickly, I like to keep sessions interactive. Uh, I'm not here to talk at you. I do want to tell you a story, but I also want to bring you with me. And, and the reason why I was asking, you know, how long you've been here, let's just circle back and I'll come back to my story in a second. Um, who's been in the business for uh, over a decade? Hands up if you've been in the business for over a decade. Right, here we go. Uh, keep your hands up if you've been in it for over two decades. Hands up, good, just good, good. Uh, so there you go, everyone with, just so you know, everyone with their hands up has been in the business longer than I have, but I'm coming after you. Uh, but I want to just point out the experience we have in the room. It would be a mistake for me to come here and think that I don't even think actually the, the sheer leverage learning opportunities in your own network for people who've been in the business a long time uh, and in Murray's words has seen it all before <laughs> many times we've got a wealth of knowledge here let's tap into that so the offer I'd like to make you today and it's up to you whether you accept it is that I'm very comfortable dancing in the moment with whatever you want to throw at me I'm very dedicated to try and engage with reality I think that we, we should be positive and optimistic uh, but at the, same at the same time, we've got to be eyes wide open and understand the nature of reality if we're to ever hope to help our clients navigate that reality. So for, uh, for that, as far as like a, an objective for today, 
Um, I, I'm very keen to engage with reality with you. And if you're with me on that journey, I hope that it will make you sharper and it will help you uh, either convince you that your perspectives are even more sure-founded or possibly you might even change your mind if you're open to that. Uh, let's get back to the story, that's all right. So, uh, here we are, three jobs, 17. One of the jobs I was doing, working out the old uh, muscles. Well, these are back in the days when phones, you lifted them up. <laughs> I'm showing my age now, hey? I worked in a call centre. And actually, I lie about lifting them up because we did have headsets in those days. It wasn't, you know, but literally the phone did have a handset. I remember the headset plugged into it. Uh, we used to call outbound, and one of our key niches that we did calls for were real estate agents. Uh, anyone hired competitive edge to do calls for them? Mm, okay, well, I don't actually know if they're still around, but Nikki Darji was the owner, uh, and um, they hired me at se uh, 16, actually, uh, to do cold calls for them. Job interview was ring up and leave a voicemail. Uh, they didn't know how old I was. When I turned up, I think they were probably shocked, uh, but fortunately, they liked me enough to give me a job, and I was quite good at it. And the penny dropped for me when I was privy to some of the testimonials that were being received. So after a little while being there, and I was really some good at it, and then I helped, <clears throat> helped train and induct some of the new people through, and with my team leader, I got to see the perspectives that they were putting out to clients, which include these testimonials, some of which came from real estate agents, and said things like, please thank David and your team for the lead you sent us, we listed the property and sold it the very next day. By the way, we're in Talpo and it was a multi-million dollar lakeside mansion. And I'm like, hmm, $10 an hour. They just do quite well, don't they? What if I should be chasing to that? Uh, so long story short, I met this guy, Steve Allen. He's a sales manager, Alger Hooker and Palmy. He obviously saw something in me and was keen to get me on board. And I went into my study when I was 17 and I thought I would start, but the real estate licensing board in those days shut up shop from about November, which is when my birthday is, all the way through to I think it must be about January, February. So I started in March 2005. Uh, but I tell you that story to just refresh you to when you first got into real estate. And if you've got pens and paper handy, I'd love you to think back, and I know for some of you it's stretching a little while, some of you it's a little easier. <laughs> So that's what, I really do want you to tap back into some of those reasons that you've got into real estate because sometimes I think we spend so much time doing it, we don't spend enough time actually thinking about our purpose and what it actually means. And I know I'm going a little bit airy fairy here, but the common things that I hear from people is things like, and by the way, if this is you, love a little bit like, mm hmm, yep, that's me. If it's none of these land, please, I want you to tell me what motivated you. But it's kind of like, I want it to be in control of my time. I wanted to be able to earn well. I wanted to have a proper career. All of my friends were making lots of money and I was a teacher and I was working harder than they were. How come you know, I should be able to do something like that? Uh, you know, I want to be rewarded for my efforts. I, I like people and I like houses. But, that's fine. Um, just ringing your bell for a minute. Okay, good, all right, that's good. You're just like me. Uh, by the way, 2005, I was 18. I was the youngest age of the army. They do say that a picture says a thousand words, so I'll let that one do the talking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you believe that anyone would sell their house within there? Actually, quite a few people did. Uh, I've shown you this for a couple of reasons. One, so you can just see. Uh, by the way, that billboard went up before I'd sold a single property. I went on a training course, I was very lucky. Uh, they put me through this thing called the Future Champions course. And one of the things we talked about was marketing yourself. And I made up a plan and basically went and door knocked the local dairy in the middle of Tarkaro and said, hey, how much did Tip Top pay you for the signage? Nothing. Oh, okay, can I put a sign up? No. Well, why did you put Tip Top up? Oh, they give us a rebate and stop. Okay, what's that worth to you? Oh, probably eight hundred to a thousand dollars a year. I said, all right, I'll give me a thousand dollars if I can put my set up too. Oh yeah, you're wrong. So there you go, cheapest billboard you ever had. Uh, by the way, um, I got lots of calls from people thinking that I was selling the dairy. <laughs> 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 uh, your local real estate specialist. I want to pick on this one a little bit by picking on me. And hey, if it fits with you, then of course, you know, if my mum always says, if the shoe fits, wear it. Um, I reckon now in hindsight, I really could have done a bit better than that because I was just going, here's the strategy. And the strategy was, you know, specialise in an area. And I kind of went on that thinking I understood it, 
but I didn't know how to communicate it well to the market, is my perspective now, with the benefit of hindsight. You know, I could have even just said, your Takara real estate specialist would have been a good next step, but I have some ideas. Uh, thankfully, some of the things I did, when I actually moved to uh, Auckland, I, I took a job uh, as a trainer with Buffett and Thompson, and these guys, Matt and Ryan, working in Grey Lynn, this was a little screenshot. You can literally, if you go back a long way, I trolled through about 300 odd photos on their social media to find it. Um, but they're the first people that I suddenly went, oh yeah, I wish I'd done that. They're amazing. I'll be great, right? But the point I want to make with, the, with their marketing is that they didn't say, we're your local real estate specialists or we're Greyland specialists. They just showed it. They just demonstrated it. Uh, this is Bunny Thorpe. Anyone been to Bunny Thorpe? Hands up. Oh yeah, hello. Nice to see you here. Uh, Glaxo, <laughs> Glaxo plant, uh, power station, train, big intersection. Tavern, by the way. I wanted to put a photo of the dairy. <laughs> What's me and dairies? Uh, do you know, I'll tell you why the dairy. I couldn't find a photo of the dairy, to be fair. Oh, I found one, but it didn't look anything like it when I saw it back in the day. So I just popped it here because I did used to go down and have a few drinks, and I'd always turn up on my search and, for you know, Bunny Thorpe. Uh, I stuck out like a sore thumb. Uh, but the interesting thing about Bunny Thorpe was that when I developed a standard operating procedure, whatever you want to call this, I'm sure you already have them. If you don't, please would you consider creating some little systems and checklists in your business. There are two key triggers. By the way, pull out your pens and paper if you want to know some life hacks on how to make your real estate uh, easier, less stressful, more successful, etc. Uh, have two triggers, time and event. When such and such a time happens, do such and such a thing. The other thing is when such and such an event happens, do such and such a thing. Uh, one of those things that I adopted, I didn't know this easy way of approaching it back then, but I did have a standard operating procedure, was every time I listed a property, I would go out and door knock 200 homes around it. It was part of my listing presentation, so when I presented to the clients, you know, I, I often say something like, I know a lot of real estate agents do everything the same. I actually like to think outside the box, and I know a lot of people move within the area or have friends in an area. So what I'm prepared to do for you, if you'd like me to, is I will door knock your entire neighborhood and ask if they know anyone that wants to purchase. Of course we do everything else, and owners loved it. I loved it too, because guess what? We got a fiduciary obligation in real estate, right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. I reckon it cuts both ways. What I mean by that is that people know we act for the seller, right? Sellers also go, well, if he can do it for himself, or if he can do it for another vendor, he can do it for us. You follow me? Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, what happened for me is, instead of like, hey, you want to sell your house, I'd just say, hey, I just listed a property you want to buy. No? Okay, who do you know that wants to buy? I can't think of anyone right now. No worries. Hang on to this. If you do think of someone, would you pass it on get them to call me? Brilliant. Oh, by the way, would you like to know what it sells for? Great. Details. Oh, by the way, when you're getting details, very quickly, what information do you get? Someone comes to your open home, what you, by the way, my advice, check them in yourself, don't give them the register or the app, just do it yourself, my, just my perspective. Uh, reason why, you get the information you want. Uh, what information do you want? Yeah. Quickly talk to me. We're going fast, guys. I'm hoping I've thread lots of stuff through my story. The only reason I'm telling you the story is, I, I don't know you, so you get a chance to know me, but I want to highlight the things I've learned from the leverage learning, working with very experienced people. Let's bang these things up. What data do you need when you're collecting someone's coming to your open home? Name, phone number. I like it, name, uh, email, phone number, mobile ideally, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Don't mind being a landline, but mobile. Do they, do they want more information or do they want to be on the buyer's yeah, database? Yeah, okay, uh, permission to contact, yeah. that's good. Where did they see the property advertised? Uh, source. Mm -hmm. Name, so first name, last name, right? Yeah. Email. Oh, you were Oh, yes. Like you take the, yeah, the when it, when, give that man a, a prize. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I am shocked. I'm shocked. Not that you're not a <laughs> I'm often surprised, but not shocked. Uh, He's shocked. By everyone but this man. Because when I, when I saw consult, I remember doing this with a salesperson, uh, and he had been working his butt off, drawn off a thousand homes, and did not collect data. 
What I mean by that is he met all these people, we gave them a copy of his monthly newsletter, and he didn't get anything in return. Now, I'm also cautious, I don't, like, I expect there to be a reciprocal relationship. Give before you get. However, like, make sure you do know what you want. Have a strategy behind you. Do not underestimate the permission economy. In a sense, like, if you've got permission to contact people, and you know enough about them to make your communication relevant, we're in a very powerful position. We're one of the only industries where we know where our customers live. Why is that important, by the way? Why am I obviously, I mean, it's quite, it might seem very, I think the rest of this gracious. Um, <laughs> well, 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 why is this important? Remind me. I always search for see they put the ship, you know, people say they're a or they're in the steakhouse. Well, you put them at the bottom of the list. <laughs> 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 hey, by the way, I'm going to say, like, you know, I did an auction in Whangarei. It's just going to seem very facetious, but it, it just shows how easy we can jump to conclusions and why doing what you just suggested is not necessarily a silly idea. Um, lady in the auction room, um, I think maybe part mouldy, bare feet, I kid you not, ripped trousers, it was all a facade. I'm talking to Tim, mm. my colleague, the lady owns like 60 rental properties. Mm. Oh my gosh. Uh, but by the way, address, so yes, and see what else they own, for sure, etc, etc, but remember, I think this is something, uh, please, yes, hello. Well, if they're looking, they might be wanting to sell. Use in the room, and the one that's jumping right to the money shop. Love it! Come on, seriously. Where are you guys? Thank you. Uh, yes, they may need to sell, right? And, and that might be now, or could be in 10 years' time. Like, we're playing the long game, right? In fact, many of you have played the long game and are still playing it. But to my mind, this is a critical piece. Who sells the property? Who sells property? Do you sell property? Do you, do you sell property? Do you really? <laughs> Hang on a second. Who sells the property? I vendor. The vendor sells the property. Yes, you facilitate the sale. They pull the trigger. So we don't actually own prop. Like we don't own no stock. We don't. We we might own own a listing. Borrow it. <laughs> Guys, girls. The vendor sells the property. So we're foolish to collect houses, we collect people, right? So name, email, phone, address. By the way, quick little audit for you if you are not collecting addresses at your open home. Uh, just ask, yeah, pretty easy. 80% will say the address. With me? Or do you already, sorry, I may have jumped to the conclusion. Do you all collect addresses? Good, excellent, you, you're nailing it. Love your work, love your work. Uh, by the way, little standard operating procedure, anyone who lives on Waiheke that I meet on the boat, I meet someone just about every time I take the boat, I'm always getting the details and then I, just when I get to their um, name, get their phone number, that's not going to be creepy because we've struck up a good rapport already. And then I just say, oh, what's your email? And most of the time they don't even bat an island at that. And then I say, oh, you live on the island? Yeah, yeah, you're oh, great, what's your address? And I'd say probably 50% of them go, oh, what on that? I said, oh, i got access to a lot of data, I can send you a free report, and it cost you about 30, 40 bucks, I'll flick it through to you right now. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Easy. Uh, by the way, cool logic, probably good, great little product there, instant. Uh, anyway, just some thoughts for you for standard operating procedures. Make your life easy with triggers, that's my suggestion. Uh, is this okay, guys? Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm going quick ish, I think. Am I a bit rambunctious today? <laughs> I feel like <laughs> no, uh, Anyway, so. Bunny Thorpe, so good, get the data. Uh, Bunny Thorpe, here I am. I'm knocking on the door. There is no letterbox. There is no letterbox. It's quite peculiar where I come from. House, letterbox at the gate, no letterbox. Just maybe there's a number there. I'm knocking at the next door. Hey, uh, actually, can you might be able to help me because I just uh, actually went to your neighbor's house and I noticed neither of you actually have a letterbox. Oh, yeah, they're all at the post office. Oh, where's that? Oh, it's at the dairy. Me and dairies, right? <laughs> so I tell you what, this is where I learned about that focus marketing piece because uh, by nature, slightly lazy. In other words, it's not that I don't have a good work ethic, it's just I want to cut to the easiest route to where I want to go. And man, like it's a lot faster to <laughs> than to walk or pay somebody else to do it. Uh, and basically, 
went something along the lines of went into the dairy said, oh, you, do you have the post office boxes here? He goes, yeah. I said, look, I've, I've got about 50 fires left over. Is it possible for me to pop them through? He goes, oh, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to let you in there. I said, oh, okay, well, it's okay. Maybe I'll buy some things and keep the change. And he said, yeah, sure, go off for your life. So it was great. Uh, so that was funny for, and man, that was a point of difference. Now, I, I just pause here. Who has a point of difference? Hands up. Okay, just okay. Who has a, uh, who's engaged and has a, an arm they can put in the air? Let's go. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, try again, everyone. Let's just go, please. I, I'm not moving past this. I just want everyone to put your hands up. Come on, Murray. Good man. That's it. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, I'm just checking. One more. Good, good, good. Hey, one more. All right, actually, you're working. One more. All right, we're working here. Uh, I do just want to, I want to go with you here, and, and it's okay if you don't. But who, who has a point of difference? Hands up. A couple of people. Do you know what? I'm going to go with you. I think, think quite often I'll do this, and half the room or maybe more will put it up. Um, but in this case, we haven't quite got there, and that's interesting to me. I'm curious to see. Uh, do you mind if I pick on you, Penny? Yeah, talk to me. And you are quite a character, by the way. In a good way, I'm sure. Uh, so keep going. What, um, what's your... So, you talk about door knocking. Mm -hmm. We're, like, largely non resident Mm. In Hawaii, so we what we have as a point of difference Very good point. is um, a race roll. Okay. Um, obviously, it wasn't. It's not public knowledge anymore, but we have maintained one for the last twenty years, which means we yeah, oh, we get them at home. Nice, great. As opposed to getting them at the beach. Good. Okay. Well, so that's a strategic <laughs> point of difference, and I really like it. Uh, by the way. There's lots of ways to create that, and the way that you've created is fantastic and maintained it and gives you an edge over your competitors. Nice work. Uh, what about, maybe I'm gonna phrase this different. What exactly is a, what exactly is your brand? Could you, could someone sum up like what their brand is, like what their personal brand is? By the way, I, I, I appreciate Richardson Real Estate or Fungamata Real Estate, like that's the corporate brand, but your name means something to people. Gavin's means the fishing spots and I. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin's is like, no, all the good fishing spots. That's it. You guys are a well ahead of the game, so I'm going to roll with this. Sounds like you've already nailed it. I'd say 80% of you haven't yet. And look, sometimes you're lucky it'll smack you in the face, like happened to me. But maybe you've got to be a little more creative. I want to encourage you, in an, in an industry where we are prone to being commoditized, what I mean by that is we're prone to having an, at least an owner tell us or feel like you real estate agents are all pretty similar, then you may as well create something that makes you different, or please, at a minimum, at least makes you memorable. So I'd suggest your point of difference is basically your brand, it's what people say about you when you're not there, or perhaps even one step further than that, how they would describe you. Like, you know that guy, he's dot, 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 Oh, you know Sally, she's the agent that dot, dot, dot. If you don't have that, much harder for people to have a placeholder for you in their mind. And a point of difference does not have to be a point of better. I'll just repeat that. Your point of difference does not have to be a point of better. It could be as simple as, uh, there's a guy, Tony Buckwell, you can go, actually he's a branch manager now, but he used to be a salesperson. He was someone that I trained when he first got started. I went to say trained. Uh, I was lucky to be a part of his journey. He was uh, an ex-fireman, um, in fact he was the chief of the local fire brigade, and he's a, a brilliant guy. And he got into real estate, and he, he's quite a funny man, and he said something along the lines of, gosh, you know, it's, moving from most trusted profession to least trusted profession. Yeah. And, uh, long story short, the guy branded himself as the fireman. Like he didn't leave his past behind, he brought it with him because he was known in the community for what he already did. And it made him memorable. So instead of having a DLE card, he had a fire hydrant. So he did all of his print media delivered was in the shape of a fire hydrant. Nothing else said the fire hydrant, nothing else said anything about it, everything else was just the <laughs> real estate stuff, but it was just in the shape of a fire hydrant. Now when that's in your letterbox versus everything else, A, it costs a little bit more to do, by the way, but is it different? Mm. Is, if, if you got a fire hydrant shape cut out of something in your mailbox, would it cut through a bit better? Yeah. So I just thought, man, that's smart, I love it. That's helped me form that point of difference element, right? Um, I'll give you more examples, but I want to keep rolling. 
Can I challenge you, if you don't have a point of difference, you get to create one, or not, but it is worthwhile being memorable. Uh, and I was really lucky, because I mentioned to you that mine smacked me in the face, I looked like a kid, uh, but I was lucky, I grafted hard, and I did get success, Funnily enough, not by, the, not by the people that my salesman thought I would be successful with. He said to me, he said, let's get you started in Takaro, Takaro Highbury Central kind of area. By the way, gave me an area that was way too big, like 2,000 houses. Um, but he said, oh, that'll be good for you because it's mainly kind of first home buyers, and so there's a good amount of churn. Strategically, he was right. He also thought I'd get on really well with both the people who were selling there and the people that were buying. He missed the mark. I can't tell you all the reasons for this as to why it is, but I, I think it's because I was so young. Like I was younger than the people that were buying and selling, like reaps in some cases quite dramatically. And they, I, I could connect with them, but not as well as I could connect with people that were like my parents' age or even better my grandparents' age. Man, those people sometimes sought me out. Why? Because I was lucky enough that I, I did connect with some of those people, I did get the sales through, and then I got this little Captain's Club logo, and it basically said, he might look young, but he knows what he's doing. And so then I became to it this onto it young guy. It just, like, people would call the office and say, oh, who's that onto it young guy that's doing lots of real estate in Bunnythorpe? Because <laughs> nobody else wanted to. I had a big <laughs> advantage, because everyone else thought it was a ratty old suburb, but my God. The lifestyle property of Browser was gorgeous. Uh, so anyway, that was good. Um, and then, I must say, uh, <laughs> that happened. Anyone remember this time? Talked to a few people. Uh, by the way, didn't for those of you who weren't uh, in real estate at the time, it wasn't the GFC. The real estate market had already tanked. And then the GFC just smacked it while it was down. <laughs> uh, so that was, the, that, was that. Uh, by the way, has anyone found the last sort of 18, 24 months tough or challenging? Yeah. Yeah. A few people saying yes, not, not many, most, well, maybe half. Have others found it to be really good? No, I think it's a full rounded no. It's a full rounded no, okay. You guys are just a little bit quiet this morning, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, well, don't, but please put things into context. Now, first thing, for those of you who do know stats and all that stuff, this is not a logarithmic scale. So as the numbers get bigger, the gaps do look bigger. But still, look at how sharp that adjustment is. Like, I don't think since records were kept, and I know there's a couple of people here that have been well, around well longer than I have, but I'd be curious to know if, if they feel like there's been a time that was more abrupt. Like, I'm, I'm calling auctions, and I'm chatting with a buyer who a month ago, if I'll tell you the story very briefly, just to give you an idea. So I'm in South Auckland calling an auction. It's a development type property. Um, this, is, this is why everyone thought the market was still cranking hot. And uh, the auction pauses. I go and talk with the buyer, talk with the seller. Seller says to me, with the agent, tell him about such and such a number and just say he must be dreaming um, because you know clearly he's way off the mark. I went back to him. He laughed in my face. He said, yeah, I bought that place. That was about a month and a half ago. I said, yeah. He goes, you're going to be dreaming. I said, pardon? He said, mate, I want you to just understand what's happened. And this is like, oh my gosh. He said, just imagine you're a theory, <laughs> uh, and you buy a crate of Coke, cola, and <laughs> He's, he says, you buy a credit card, let's say they say a per unit price at $6 a bottle. I think you might have been talking about beers and a liquor store, but we're going dairy, it's way, way cooler. Um, and, and he says, all of a sudden your supplier contacts you and says, hey, really sorry, we can't deliver the product anymore. Oh, and by the way, we've had to increase our prices by 30%. Oh, and we can't guarantee delivery. It could be as long as six months. He says, I'm sorry, that's the best you're gonna see. And I conveyed the information, they chose not to sell, and that's besides the point. I bet you they wish they did now, but we just didn't know at that time. And so that was kind of probably about here that that started happening. So much like the GFC, um, sure, it was interest rates that really impacted us, but certain factors you know, killed it earlier. Uh, and and I, the reason I tell you that is that 
It's important to just recognize if you were selling through that time and you felt the bumpy ride, we'll know like it's been a big, big bump. The difference in the market forces and why I want to come to this, particularly if you're sitting here and if you are in a bit of a flat period, I just want you to recognize what's happened. Don't be too hard on yourself. Also recognize that it's tough for everyone and that as long as you can keep your head in the game and change your practice slightly or just hang on, things change. But by the way, like just recognize where we've been with it and the difference is that in a really hot market, when I say the words hot, all I'm talk, really, the thing that affects us more than which way prices are moving is the volume of sales, is it not? Mm. And like, I don't know about you, but I can tell you back when I was selling Palmy, what this graph doesn't show is that we were doing like 180 sales a month in Palmy North, and that was obliterated. It dropped down to like 60. And if you're a salesperson, like I was, and even if you, well, actually I got hit harder than most of the market, I reckon, I just had no idea how to adapt at that point in time. Like, that's brutal. So the volume of sales contracting, but the piece there is that because we're naturally as humans, we, uh, we get context, uh, contextual cues. I'm gonna go a little bit into psychotherapy here. But just to say that like, we get external feedback, and when the market's busy, it naturally makes us feel busy, and we do more work. Because more people are calling us, and we've got lots of stuff happening, and so we go. So what happens for most salespeople is that when the market contracts, their activity contracts. So I challenge you, I don't know what percentage your market's down, or maybe it's not even down where you are, but the key part to remember is, if, let's just say, let's put a placeholder, let's say you're down a third, right? Let's say the market dropped by a third. If you don't increase your activity from where you were to a third, you're going backwards. That's also okay if that's your choice, if you don't want to increase your activity, but just recognize if you're just following the market's activity, you're probably doing less, less busy than you were, and consequently, you're just floating along. And I'll tell you the story from guys that rode across the Atlantic. I heard this at a conference, and I thought, man, I can't tell the story like they did, but I remember the takeaway. They're in the middle of the storm. Big storm comes in. They're talking to the team captain. Captain saying, hey, it's just two, two people rowing, basically. Saying, basically, guys, batten down the hatches, throw over the, the sea anchor. Um, you, you're in for a real rough night. And they talked to each other, and they made the call, we're just going to keep rowing. So they didn't throw over the sea anchor, they kept rowing. Uh, morning comes, they look on the GPS, they have not moved. However, all the competitors throw over a sea anchor got blown back. Race ended and they won by a margin that was basically the difference between having thrown over the sea anchor or kept rowing. So, the message I want to give you here is that you're a statistical anomaly. <coughs> you can tr control your internal motor. You really do have to network in with your colleagues and get a good crew together that are putting their shoulder to the millstone and doing the hard work. But certainly, if you want to change your real estate life, 30 connected calls per work day for a month, I promise you, you'll transform your business. <laughs> if the phone's not ringing, make it ring, it's basically what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, there we go, that's a little bit, I just wanted to say, interestingly enough, um, this, is, this is a few years later, that's 2010, so we're doing it five years then. Um, this was a debate signed by my happy clients, which was quite nice, and they posted it for me on social media. And then, like, I, at that point, social media was happening, but no one really used it professionally. Uh, and so I was, I think, one of the first, I'm sure there were many, but I was one of that crew that suddenly figured out that social media um, can be quite good for business. And this is nice. You know, thank you, Mr. Calvin, and tagged me into it. And then I put a little thing in there saying, keep more business, basically. Um, that, alongside other things happening, uh, was really interesting. This is me, by the way, um, back then. I think that's probably another couple of years later. Um, I'm going to say near the end of the sales piece, I reckon I probably sold real estate for about two years too long in Palmy. And I put that into the context of probably sold real estate too long in Palmy. I think if I'd made a move somewhere else, I may have quite happily continued to do real estate sales. But I, at that point in time, most of my good friends had left. 
Um, I was really into music. I ran this is I put this up here because it's just a little piece of my story, but I want to share kind of the ups and downs of it with you. Like I found that market adjustment really tough, uh, and I wish that I had some of the tools that I have now to go back and say, hey mate, why don't you try doing these things? Um, but long story short, um, I did love this stuff. This was um, the band's lunchbox, and we used to do a little midday show at the Massey um, FM, and it ended up with me taking a role uh, in the Hawks Bay, which by the way, beautiful spot to be, um, almost as good as the Coromandel. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, they, I got a senior account manager role there with a stint on the Saturday morning show. Um, that lasted about six months, by the way. If anyone thinks that real estate agents um, can be sharks, I tell you what, so can uh, radio sell you. Um, <laughs> glad I got out. It was really lucky. Um, uh, I got a role with Barford and Thompson as their corporate trainer. And this was just like a real sweet spot. You know, if, if you can find the joy of doing um, things that you're good at, that you really love, and find a way for that to, to pay you a good crust, man, that's a really happy overlap. Um, and I feel very lucky to be doing what I do today um, along the way. Um, and this was a big piece of that. Uh, it was actually, I had access to 1,700 odd salespeople, and I basically, could do what I wanted as long as I was helping them grow. And so I did all sorts of interesting pieces where I did some research through the marketing team and then we'd try these sort of things and we'd see how come that salesperson's working real well and then we'd create a training course and put it out. It was just so much fun. Um, I'll give you a little snippet just of what that time was like um, with uh, the, the, these guys. And by the way, just check the sound here. Thursday morning. Can you guys hear that? Uh, lovely to be here this morning. That's for, for Gary. For Gary. But Gary tells me nobody likes him, and actually, he's the only one who's seen him. Thank you so much, Jeff and Link from Marco. Thank you so much for the hamper. Fantastic to get. That's how you get more hampers. <laughs> uh, this is Sam. She looks after our uh, property management training. Beavering away. The only one that doesn't get work around here. Um, actually, that's sort of like probably uh, Sarah, of course, does quite a bit of work. We've got a little bit of. Uh, Zombie apocalypse. Why did you see the cupboard, Steve? And if that doesn't look like a mouth, just have a look in the cupboard. Why did you not? Yeah. Yeah. The trainer. The trainer. Yeah. The trainer. The trainer. Yeah. The reason I want to show you that um, <coughs> is that I started doing video. So I'm, tr I'm telling you my story, but I, I had a brainwave about it. It wasn't that I, like, obviously it's such a privilege for me to now share my story with you. But I really wanted to thread some things through it, which have made, like, a monumental difference to my business. And for the salespeople who are using these things, uh, they're streaking ahead of their competitors. And it doesn't happen overnight. So can I just ask, has anyone here done video for real estate? How many of you have done a video for real estate? I know a few of your team have. Okay, I've, I've, I reckon we've probably got about a third of the room has. Uh, and by the way, I've seen some of your videos, and some of them are brilliant. Uh, I, I, um, I just want to recognise the people that have, because I know, and I'm guessing for most of you, that was a real step outside the comfort zone. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah? Big step outside the comfort zone, right? Amen. <laughs> it is. Uh, anyone ever recorded themselves and then heard their voice? <laughs> Not pretty, is it? Just want you to recognise a couple of things here. The sound of your own voice, actually you sound like that. You don't know what you sound like because you're used to hearing it through your bones. Uh, by the way, yes, you do look like that. Except you're not used to seeing yourself like that because normally you look at yourself in the mirror. You're around the other way, you don't only see one angle. You do look like that. It's important to just sit with that for a moment because I think so many people feel like they have to be, you know, Abby, or they have to be Penny, or they have to be David, or whatever. No, absolutely not. In fact, the reason why I show you this almost like very candid video is that I think whilst there is a, a, a definite place for, and I strongly want to endorse and encourage and commend our team for already doing property videos, I want to show you the secret sauce, which is actually if you can just be yourself on camera, not easy, by the way, does not happen overnight, by the way. I'm showing you this back from 2013, so that you don't just think, oh yeah, David got there like that. Like, that was the start of the journey. 
But simply by doing this stuff and being, what's the right word? Lucky enough to just stumble along the way, I've got better and better and better at it. Uh, but I, I also just want to say, look, I, I did a fair amount of video, and in fact, I still have the long format recording. So, some even with like reasonably good production in terms of like camera setup, lapel mics, all that kind of stuff. Do you know what? Some of those videos, I interviewed Josh Fegan. Has anyone seen that interview with me and Josh Fegan? Guess what? Because I never published it. I listened back to it, watched it back. I was like, <gasps> oh my God, I could never, sh oh, I'm too embarrassed. I, honestly, and it, you know what? There were some real good bits in that, but because of my own insecurity, and to be fair, had to get better, but I didn't have to get better. Like actually, I stopped that going out when I reckon, I wish I'd, I wish I'd done it live, basically, is what I now think. Because there was good stuff in there, but then when I listen back to it and I'm umming and erring and stumbling and asking a dumb question or feeling like it, I was just like, oh, I can't publish this. But it's all part of the journey because it, for me, it gifted me the opportunity to, to A, get a bit of practice and B, have some little uh, things that, what's the right word? Some little lucky moments. And I do think if you are following your nose and you are genuinely working hard at stuff, you will get your breakthroughs and it's all part of the journey. Um, I did want to show you this because um, we can't actually see it very well there, but that's my wife, Kelsey and I, in the Amalfi. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a very beautiful spot, um, but she is a big part of my success, uh, and I don't think I'll be doing it independently if it hadn't been for her backing. She's an entrepreneur, she's a fashion designer. She's basically never been employed in her life, and really so, so good to have somebody in my corner um, that encouraged me along the way. So I really, that was a big, you know, a really good thing that happened to me. Um, also, this was a really happy moment working at Barford and Thompson. I was so lucky. I got given this big budget and I got to basically run a recruitment and training program for one of the leading real estate agencies in Auckland. I learned so much and I got to recruit a whole bunch of people, many of whom are still my mates to this day. Um, and I do a training seminar, for example, did a verifiable seminar in Auckland, and I'm sitting there and I see like some of the top agents and they're all people that I work with. It's such a cool thing. I love, I, that, that for me is just so cool. Uh, and I would say, it's always interesting to note the things that land for people. And I really encourage you, because it would mean a lot to me. If, I, if something I mentioned today, or something you take away from it, resonates with you, and maybe it's immediately, maybe it's six years from now, who knows. Uh, but would you let me know that it, it meant something to you? Because I bumped into somebody the other day, actually was one of those verifiable training uh, uh, events. And this guy came up to me and said, oh, Dave, you probably don't know this, but you made a massive difference. And I was like, really? What's, what's the story? He's like a manager in Tower now, I think. Um, and, and I said, oh, what, what, he said, what, you said something in one of your training seminars that changed my life. I was like, oh, oh my God, okay, talk to me. Tell me more. He said, you said that you used to do calls from your backyard when it was a nice day. I said, yeah, absolutely. Here I am in Palm Hall, if you're far between. Um, <laughs> but uh, I used to sit in the backyard and just make calls. It was a sunny day and that was it. My happy place making calls and he does it on the beach and he said that changed his life. I'll tell you one other thing that somebody said to me changed his life and I encourage you that this is you to, to take hold of this um, and, and also do the piece this guy did. I caught up with him for a coaching session and some clients would catch up with me maybe like once a year or once a quarter and we just do a little bit of work and he said to me, he goes, you know, you said something to me that um, stuck with me to this day and so it's why I'm here. I was like, oh, what's, what's that? And he said, well, after we've been talking for a little while and I've been sharing my challenges and I was about to leave the industry, what he said, um, I didn't know that at the time. He said, you said, mate, you're doing everything right, just keep going. I had no idea that that was the thing that landed for him. So I want you to recognize some of these things because maybe you are doing everything right, just keep going. I uh, did a sales manager stint at Greenlane. Um, these are some of my um, sales people. It was a really multifaceted office. We did everything from apartments in Queenstown to mansions in Epsom. Uh, but very, very cool to be part of. I was lucky I got to run some like interviews with salespeople and get better at what I do. And I got to interview Tom Panos. That was quite a highlight. And he does the interviewing, so it's nice to do the opposite. Uh, then I went out on my own, and I, I love it. It's so cool I get to work with businesses and people like you. Uh, and I've done you know big stuff, small stuff, everything in between. Boom, in COVID. <laughs> and I had been out on my own that long, to be honest, and I had a bit of work stacked up, and I was starting to feel good about it, and then it all got cancelled. And I'm like, I've got a family to support now, and I'm going, oh my God. And my wife's like, well, maybe just look at it as a gift. 
we um, moved to what I'll say once again, first one, first piece, right? Remember me, did lots of interviews, want to create content, it kept running up against my perfectionism. Well, COVID was such a gift because it leveled the playing field. Everyone's just doing interviews on Zoom. And a combination of just kind of going, well, I'm level playing field and doing it live, and away we went. I interviewed all sorts of interesting people. Uh, and that was a bit of a COVID tip. So I'm just kicking off a new series at the moment. If you want to tune in, uh, the topic is AI, Real Estate Friday Drinks. Uh, this, this Friday, 3 o'clock. Uh, you can't see it up there, but just John Abbott right at the top. Got to interview John. I don't know if you guys ever did any work with John, but he's a great man. Uh, listen, and um, I'm lucky I'm kind of in a weird way following in his footsteps. Uh, here we go. That was the island. So we're after co first lockdown, then I moved to Waikiki. Uh, this uh, was a little bit of um, a post that we did when I got into real estate from Waikiki. And that was, in a weird way, I actually, my wife twisted my arm to do it. We did it kind of out of necessity. Um, but also, I'd always had an itch, and people would often say to me when they're in a training session, they're like, how come you're a trainer? Why don't you just sell? You'd be amazing, blah, blah, blah. And I was not interested in selling at all. But I always did think, oh, it would be a good thing to go back to at some point. And so I was like, okay, all right, we'll do it. Uh, and that was a lot of fun, and it was great. Because I, I kind of, like this is a sale that we made during lockdown. You guys will remember this. But well, most of, everyone will remember it, I'm sure, but some of you sell real estate. Uh, this was our lovely owner, Jill. This property was at 26 Ocean Road. It is probably like, you, in, in your career, you always have these like memorable sales for different reasons. Um, I can tell you the reason for this one is, um, I prospected it, so it was a withdrawn listing. I was so stoked, it was a business I tracked down, hunted it, hunted killed it. <laughs> a lovely lady, by the way, it sells it so crass. Um, but she had come to the market previously, hadn't sold. Tell you why, oh my gosh, that property just riddled with problems. It was kind of, it was a cool property, but it had no CCC issued, it had weather tightness issues, uh, council had issued a section 95A letter, it's basically saying, do not conduct any remedial works without first obtaining a building consent to do the remedial works. Uh, Jill went into that without the building consent, oh dear. Uh, then of course there's your beautiful looking home, but the council basically say, despite it looking like it's all been done right, you have to take it all back off again and do it. We sold it, effectively not sight unseen, because I was doing like your video calls. Um, I called my own auction, it was so fun, uh, and, and, and we sold it, which was great. So I, I tell you, the reason I tell you that story was it was so nice to go back and scratch the itch, and I got to do a few things, which, and this is why I'm trying to thread it through my story. Uh, and I tell you these things, it, it's, it's, it might sound like I'm trying to impress you. I want to share the, the, I feel so lucky that I got to have a go again, and you get to have a go again every day. I want you to pick, like, if you can pick just one thing that for you go, oh yeah, that's a good idea, I'll do that, and it helps you, I'll feel great. I got to do, what my boys in Grayland did, in my own little way. That's just literally, I did not curate that, I just went and found the old social media, took a screenshot of the images, because that's kind of what I started posting. Our little talk about standard operating procedures, anytime I had an appraisal or was getting a listing, up goes the folder, street sign, click, off to Kelsey to publish. Just a little standard operating procedure that kind of branded us as real estate in the place. Borrow it, steal it, improve it, do whatever you like. Um, this was this was when I realised, and, and by the way, like I do lots of coaching, so and I'm often I remember that, I'll tell you a, a little story. I get a call from a mate of mine who's a lawyer. This is when I was a sales manager. Get a call from a mate of mine who's a lawyer. He says, "Hey, Dave, just a heads up. You've got a very unhappy uh, client." I said, "Oh, oh dear." Turns out it was a client of the company I was working with, but it, fortunately, it doesn't matter. They were a salesperson within that, that network. Um, and she said, look, they came into the office because they've sold unconditionally, um, and we gave them a bottle of Bollinger and some flowers, and they said that, you know, thank you so much, and you won't believe it, we haven't got anything from B&T. And I was just like, well, okay. And I think there's always two sides to a story, right? So I asked the name of the salesperson, I called up the salesperson, I just said, hey, just want to check on the, the transaction at such and such a street. How did it go? She said, oh, it was amazing. We got them a huge price. She said, the owners are over the moon. 
Okay, cool, that's fantastic. Um, hey, can I ask you, have you got them a gift at all, by any chance? She said, yeah, got them a beautiful hamper. Beautiful hamper. I was like, okay, great, have you given that to them? Oh no, probably hasn't settled yet. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I will encourage you to reach out to make sure that everything's good. <laughs> right? Like, I, mean, I don't want to betray confidence, but at the same token, like, I used to do the same thing the salesperson was doing. And I mean, some of you probably do this as well. By the way, no criticism of giving a handpo on settlement. Even better, put it in the house and, you know, a little note, and, you know, rubbish comes on such and such. By the way, we turned on the hot water cylinder for you yesterday, like, whatever. But, like, recognize the peak moments. What I mean by that is they've just made a commitment to you to sell the house. You know, I remember my old mentality, great, now I've got to go to work. No guarantee of a sale here, particularly in this climate, right? So on the island, thanks Kelsey, by the way, great campaign manager, moment this thing signed, boom, flowers, straight out courier delivered to the person. Uh, and it resulted, like we had a couple of these posts um, on the local community page. I had not yet sold a house on the island and I've got a raving client literally posting on social media about how much they liked us. And then of course when you sell a property and they do the same thing, it's just so good. And this little part here just says that's posted in that community group. There's like 10,000 people on that community page and it was great to have like people say nice things. Um, this I wanted to show you, Remember, so I'm, I'm trying to thread the things through my message to you today. One of the things, like I hope you heard the peak moments piece, that may or may not be something you can improve or integrate. But I, I, I want to bring it, it your, to your attention, like, remember the video story? Now, of course, do your property video. We're going to have a bloopers reel so you can have a laugh and recognise just how, how it's a great place to start if you're not yet comfortable in front of the camera because you can stuff it up as many times as you like. When you do it live, it's a bit more risky, but I want to encourage you that if you practice this stuff, and look, you don't have to go live for your first view if you don't want to, although I am going to challenge you at the end of today, just forewarning you. Um, <laughs> anyone nervous? It's okay, I'm with you. Um, but when you do this stuff, and for me, the penny drop moment, remember COVID, doing it live, level playing field, just get it out there. So I'm doing these market updates, uh, and I should tell you, the first market update I did in Ireland, <coughs> I think we had about 250 comments on it, because I shared it on the community page, by the way. Um, I would say 95% of the comments were pure vitriol and hatred. Like, on it, I was shocked. I mean, I'm, I've got a reasonably thick skin now, um, thanks to that event. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, to give you a perspective on this, like, not only were the comments quite bad, I never saw this, it's probably a good thing, but, um, I was told about it by my, my colleague. Somebody took a still out of that video, put a Hitler moustache on it, <laughs> posted it in the thing saying, newsflash, neo-Nazi real estate agent moves to the island and posted it. And thank God a couple of people jumped in and said, here's two small children, you know, take that down, basically. Mm -hmm. I never saw it. But I just want to point out, like, if you do put yourself out there, do not be surprised if the world hates you. <laughs> Do you know what though? I did not prospect very much on the islands. It's shocking to say. All the business just came to me. Because I had such a high profile from like just a couple of little events where everyone hated me, but enough people, <laughs> <laughs> enough people liked me that I'd get inbound calls. Well, I, I, I'm not exaggerating this. I want you to understand. I literally listed a property, and, and once again, I don't sell, I, I, I feel like I'm bragging. And so I'm saying this, I really mean this humbly. I just want to share my story with you because I hope it inspires you. You'll have a different journey than mine, but I know you're on the journey. I literally had the local home stages on the island call me up and say, hey, I um, wondered if we can set up a Zoom meeting, middle of COVID by the way. Um, we want to just uh, get your advice on selling our property. I said, yeah, sure, happy to sell the meeting, boom, away we go. Like, but they had already made a decision to list with me. And the, the videos is what did it. They, I can literally tell you, because I asked them part of the way through that, I said, hey, uh, appreciate the opportunity. Can I ask, why did you ask me in today? And they told me, well, we saw your market update and we figured that any man who can do what you did can sell our house. So I'll show you what happens when you do go live and why sometimes just being yourself is the money shot. 
a, a massive 50 percent year on year so that brings the new house price median on the island in august 2021 to 1 billion Four hundred and twenty thousand. Uh, of course, great news if you own property and hope to move off the island, as your prices have gone up just like everywhere else. Um, unsurprisingly, the um, number of sales on the island have actually gone uh, down, as you would imagine with the lockdown. But I don't think it's just related to that. Um, oh, and here we go. The joys of lockdown. We're also looking at the same time. So let's see what's happening. Are you okay? What happened? Oh, 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 It's okay. Oh no, you got mute sound on the music bar. I'm going to finish the housing update and then it's all. I'll get you a new music bar. Pop it on the music bar. Music bar. It's not good, guys. You know this. And it is good news. We are going to see an uptick in the market in terms of the volume of transactions because we've got pent up demand from people who couldn't uh, either come to the market or sell um, during the lockdown. So a lot of campaigns were postponed or cancelled. Online, um, I have no option. Postponed. And um, alongside that, we also saw that, uh, you know, especially the last couple of months leading up to um, lockdown, there were a lot of people I was talking to waiting on hold back and to come into market because they were worried they were going to find anything else. There you go. Half for you. There you go. You want some too, Jamal? There you go. So long story short, <laughs> Typical catchphrase of mine, long story short, it always says it's a long story. Um, I wanted to share that with you because like, I would not have been able to do that without a bit of practice from doing them. Also, I know my staff, you may not have noticed it there, but I have my iPad handy with my three key points, key little bits of info that I needed. Like, you don't have to just do it cold. Put yourself a post-it note on your phone or have a piece of paper that you can refer to. Try not to look at it, but if you lose your train of thought, you go back and then you know where it is. But the opportunity exists for you to demonstrate your own expertise. Now, I happen to like the data. Um, Karen knows and so does Emma and others that I looked for data to support um, a story. Uh, and I always like looking into it so that I can tell a true story basically, just like you need to substantiate your claims, I want to substantiate anything that I make as well. Uh, and, uh, Jemima, it's great to be able to do real estate again, and it's great to be on the island, and I've got to also say by the way, I'm really grateful I'm not selling now, um, it's a really hard job, uh, it's you deal with the friction of the marketplace, you've got to have a lot of resiliency, uh, for me, being stretched in directions of auctioneer, sales trainer, and agent, young family, playing a band, like getting out on the boat and diving, too much. Sometimes better to do less and do it well. Uh, when I started to feel like I could not practice what I preached, I almost had a mental breakdown, I had to say no. It's, and I'm glad I did. Uh, but it was such a good time at the same time. Uh, this is me, um, my first auction client was on Waiheke, and then I got to be my own client, call my own auctions, uh, and really, really, um, Really good thing that I, I did, I called auction, I did the LG Hooker Auction Championships so back in like 2007 and it was a finals, but I never pursued it. Clearly it was just not the right time in my journey. Um, but now I do, and I'm a professional auctioneer, I love it. Um, I've now done uh, over 500 auctions, now about 570 now. Um, still a uh, still lot, long way to go, I recognise, but I love working with the guys in Polo, I've got some really good um, team members there. I, actually, I'll, I'll back up slightly, but I just want to talk about the true story, right? Um, I reckon there are only two, like break it down, really the two levers, lots of different ways to pull these levers, but the two levers that you want to try and move if you're wanting to shift the bottom line of your business is either more stock into the market and keep your current stock out strategy or improve your stock out strategy or even better, do both. I see auction as being an improvement to your stock out strategy. That's why you know, I, and I know some of the leaders here um, basically suggested talking about auctions would be a good place to go. I don't do that, um, with, what's the right word? I do it with a lot of respect, because I should tell you about my journey. Up until this point, I think I'd had maybe five auction campaigns in my whole life as a salesperson. Like nobody in Palmerston, well, no, very few salespeople, and certainly not within my company, did auctions in Palmerston North. They did not work. I didn't think they worked. Uh, and 
I now remember how I said to you, I wish I could go back and talk to you know, my younger self and say, mate, this is a tough time, it is going to be hard, but I do have some ideas for you on how you can get through it and improve your performance. And definitely one of those would have been if I understood how to adapt auction to the market. Because a lot of people go auction as a strategy, but they don't understand that you have to, you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very effective tool, but it does depend a little bit on how you wield it. And it's a mistake to wield it in the same way if the market forces have changed. But if you learn how to work with it, oh my goodness, the reason why I put up these data, now this is not your data, I'm really sorry. It's not a statistically relevant number that I was given. You, you have not done enough auctions for me to be able to tell a true story. It would be misleading. By the way, the numbers do look great, but I just know that they're misleading. They look too good to be true to my eye, basically, about how your auctions have worked. Now, by the way, that might shock you, because I don't know what you've seen in terms of the auctions that you've done, but I did a presentation in Timaru. They said auctions don't work, but the leadership of that um, company said, we want you to talk about auctions because they're getting us really good results. I said, okay, that's interesting. Um, tell me more about that. And they said, oh, you know, definitely we're selling them a lot more of them after auction. I said, have you got the numbers? Not exactly. I said, well, could you get me the numbers? And so I asked them, they went back 12 months and they gave me the result of everything that came to market that was prior to treaty and everything that came to market either initially listed or subsequently listed as auction. And I want to just put to you, what do you think would be the fair litmus test as to whether or not an auction um, has helped the property sell? What would be a reasonable way to judge whether or not it was a successful marketing campaign? Whether it sold at auction. Whether it sold at auction? Well, just whether it sold. Oh, whether it's sold. I'm, I'm seeing some people shaking their head, but I'm looking here, and the reason why I say whether it's sold or not is that the data is very interesting. So I'm going to tell you what happened in Timaru because I suspect for many of you this may push your buttons. I make no apology for that. However, I'm also empathetic to that. I want you to understand. I genuinely thought auctions were not a good way to sell based on my personal experience and that of my colleagues at our Jehovah and Palmerston North. That is what I honestly believed. I have changed my mind, but I would say it took me years. So I'm very empathetic to your journey, and if the shoe fits, wear it. If this is, that doesn't sound right to you, that's totally fine. But I would ask your permission to just engage with the numbers with me, because I'll tell you what happened in Timaru. So here we go. I, I do the data with them, I'll get, make sure I get the numbers exactly right. Um, I, they, they had, uh, 374 private treaty listings. It's not the numbers up on screen. I, I, I'm going to give you the Timaru data and then I'll look at this other client of mine's data, right? Timaru, 374 private treaty listings, 109 of them sold. Now, I don't know how hard your market's been hit, but that's less than a third of their listings sold. To me, that is a tough market. Can I ask, is your market a bit better than that? Or is it about the same? So um, full, full disclosure, I know then you're, you are working in what is a hard work environment. Not everything you list is selling, by, obviously by a country mile. Uh, let me give you the auction numbers, all right? And I'll tell you the response I got. So they had 90 auction listings. Of those, 58 sold. The percentage is 64%. That is more than twice the amount of properties were sold. Now, I just want to take you back, just picture Timaru, similar size audience actually, as a group of five officers that came together. When I see this number, <coughs> I literally had one like angry salesperson, he's making it up, it's not true, <laughs> literally said to me. I said, hey, this is not my data, it's your financial controller, can you just confirm these are your numbers? 100% my numbers. Must be wrong, I've seen the auctions, they're not selling. Chap at the front, the director of the business, he says, pipe down, I've checked the data twice, it's accurate, but I didn't believe it either. I was like, oh, this is a really interesting conversation. <laughs> this salesperson <laughs> is red in the face, they are angry. I, so I'm like empathetic, I don't know their story, I don't know what's going on. There's a chap sitting right here, I've got to tell you, he's laughing, he says, I told you! <laughs> Guess how many auctions were his? 88 of the 90 auction listings were his. He is their top salesperson. In fact, he's one of the top salespeople in the South Island. The guy 
is doing almost everything by auction. No, by the way, almost. Because whilst I believe you can auction any property, unless there's gross uncertainty, in which case uncertainty kills deals and you need to prepare the seller's case before you still put it to auction, but you definitely cannot auction any vendor, or every vendor, rather. So whilst you can auction every property, I don't think you can auction every vendor. Now he's smart to that. Um, but he just says, I told you, it's not about what happens on the day. And then I said, because I heard somebody else say this, I thought it was really smart. I said, well, don't you think it's a little bit, because there were some salespeople that said, nah, this is not true, doesn't matter, you judge an auction by what happens on the day. And I just said, well, look, you get to believe whatever you believe, but certainly I feel it's a little unfair to judge a six week campaign on a 15 minute moment. Numbers don't lie. When you're a leader in the business and you're looking at what this performance looks like, this is a business that I've worked with. For, this is, by the way, this is now old data. I'm showing you the year that was. This is 2022. This is South Auckland. Brutally hit. 415 private treaty, 195 auction. We're a reasonably strong auction business. We lost some salespeople along the way and they've come back. Uh, typical days on market, 39. 90 day clearance. By the way, this is private treaty highlighted. Private treaty, 90 day clearance rate. 29.7%. Here's the auction numbers. Totally different area than Timaru. Weirdly, similar metric. Mm -hmm. Almost double clearance at the 90 day mark. Now I'm gonna say, there are a myriad, there are a myriad of facets as to why the, this data tells the story that it tells. It would be a mistake to think that all you need to do is say, I'm gonna auction the property and get this result. You have to know how to wield the tool, make no mistake. Uh, I'm, I know some of you are doing auctions and are working with me and I appreciate the business. Uh, I hate I'm putting on the spot here slightly, but you said something very kind to me and I'd like to just pay some respect to that. Hayden said to me, I didn't expect that you would actually be helping me through the campaign. I thought you just turn up on the day. Uh, my, uh, sorry, my promise to you is if you want to know how to wield the auction tool, it's in my interest and yours and most importantly, in your client's interests that you do so well. It would be a disservice for you to think that I can take you through all the different eventualities or possibilities of what's going to happen through your campaign here in the next 10 minutes. Simply to say, if you don't believe the data, that's okay, do some digging. If you believe that this is true and you're not sure how to wield the tool, then good, that's a good place to be in. If you know how to do it and you're not doing it, then I'm going to put my hand right. up here and say that um, that we, well, Gavin and I have not used David, we've used his beardy, beardy offsider. <laughs> Mike is the man. <laughs> Mike the man. And I have, the man sweated bullets. I mean, we didn't know what we were going into with him the first time we did the, an auction with him, and I have never seen someone work so hard in my life. Really, really hard on, and that's on the day. Absolutely, and um, the great thing is sitting in with um, with him with the um, you know the, the fun meeting with the vendor and going through the marketing you've done, and like reinforcing that our marketing is being the most effective that could be in the market. So yeah, it was it's, it was interesting. Thank you for sharing. I I, I reckon um, there are so many different um, reasons why, but I want to just take a little brief temperature check here. Yeah, well, this is where I reckon I've got, I'm guessing about 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah about 15 yeah. minutes, right? And I'm quite comfortable to roll with whatever is most meaningful and important to you. Uh, and we can possibly do a little bit of both, but I think let's just get a sense of where you're at. If you want me to talk a little bit more about auctions and possibly explore what I hope are some reservations that you have, because if you don't have and you're not doing you know, like, you must have reservations, I want to go there. Or if you would rather talk a little bit more about video and some, some aspects there about how we can actually um, start that process for you, uh, I'm in your hands, folks. I'm also, by the way, if neither of these topics interest you and you want me to talk about something else, I'd love to. I'm quite happy. Like, I, I, I'm very happy working. I want you just to, in your mind, go, what's going to make a difference for me? Have a quick think right now. What's going to make the biggest difference for me? Reflect on it, 
It can be either of those two subjects or something else that's really challenging you at the moment or an opportunity that you see and you go, I'd love to pick David's brains on this. I'm gonna get a bit of a temperature check from the room. Have you all got something? Work with me, team. You all got something? Those who have, you're gonna get the opportunity because I'm gonna go where the people are. Talk to me, what do you want? With, with property videos, obviously people's attention span is a lot shorter than the classic three minute property video for your upper listings. Um, what we seem to be noticing is 30, 30 to 45 seconds seems to be getting the highest interaction rate. Anything over a minute seems to be dropping off. So it appears that people's attention span is sort of moving into more of a TikTok. TikTok basically, mm. um, right. which is really unfortunate when you've got a really high end listing that you would love to really, really showcase all the like the top ten points. But but really, 30, 30 seconds to one minute seems to be basically people's attention spans nowadays, which is quite disappointing when you've got a, a really good <laughs> property. But you've only got six seconds to get them hooked at the video at the start, so go that's a good point. Yeah. Folks, are others interested in me addressing this? Mm -hmm. Sure. Great, let's talk. Thank you, by the way. Abby, what's your name again? Abby. Abby, love your work on your videos. Out, absolutely. And if Abby can't grab them, I don't know who can. Yeah. Because your, your videos are fantastic. They're, they are different and they're you. I love it. Um, so, to the attention span. I think it's important to recognise there are different audiences. So if we look at, if you imagine if we could be really creepy, by the way, you can be kind of creepy, but not necessarily quite to this level. Imagine we could look at a property video of yours and know exactly who the viewers were, right? Who do you think watches that video the entire way through? Yourself. The agent, good. Yep, now that's, uh, by the way, please do, you know, trust your editors, but, you know, back check them. Uh, yeah. Your mum, that's good. Thank you, mum. Love you. Uh, the vendor. The vendor. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Because if you look at stats, people look at the photos. Mm. Well, when we get stats from real estate, oh, um, it shows people looking at the photos. I think it's important to recognise we've got multiple audiences, right? Who's watching this thing? So, yes, we do, and our friends and whatever else. Uh, the vendor. Yeah. Now, can I say why that is so important and why I like auction, but it's not just auction, clearly, because this is not necessarily for an auction property, is that you're, especially in this market, our vendors are looking for any way off the hook, aren't they? Like any chance that they've got to say, oh, well, you know, I don't know if we've exhausted the market yet, or what about, like, you want to shut every possible escape route for them to blame you or to think that you haven't done everything you could do. You want them to be like, unavoidably, I don't know what else we could do. Like if we make the problem theirs and they're not willing to adjust price and you put it to them, well, I'm not sure what else we can do. And they say, yeah, I'm not sure what else we can do either. You've done a great job of the marketing. Well, then we're doing our job at least in one avenue, right? So the vendor watches the whole thing. If the vendor likes the video and thinks, man, you know, Abby's done a great job of the video, that's a big vote in our corner it's so important that our key stakeholder is remains confident in us. This is, by the way, I wanted to show you this, I'm sure you've seen it before, but this is like agent's motivation, time on market, <laughs> uh, vendor motivation, time on market. Like, you can outlive the vendor. <laughs> you know, by the time the property's having a birthday, I got one client, uh, not an auction client by the way, uh, you know, he sold a property after about a year and a half on the market. He's already sold it, he just outlasted them. <laughs> Market got worse and worse and worse. He's, by the way, this is one of the reasons why I like auction. Sold it for about two hundred thousand less than he could have sold it in the first few weeks of the campaign. But they did sell it. Oh, now how is that a facility? I, I want to answer the um, the video question. So please, can I park it, Eddie, and drag me back to it? I just want to put one little thing about why I see the auction piece being successful. It's very simply that if we ask our owners to make a decision in week one, they don't have enough information to make a good decision but also if we've got the most motivated buyer in the door making what they believe and probably you believe is a really good offer if we don't have a legitimate reason as to why we're not taking it we lose it immediately right happened to you mm -hmm. you know when you bought a really good offer 
and the vendor says, mm, and the buyer was to buy something else, and you're like, oh my god, it's bought the Harcourt's listing, or whatever, right? It's so annoying. This is a slight difference, v vendor management versus buyer management. Mate, we don't have an agency relationship with the buyer. We help them, but they're gonna go and do what they wanna do. Uh, so anyway, long story short, agent's motivation there, we just have a very valid reason to delay the vendor making a decision for a few weeks until we've given them enough information that they can make a good decision. Back to the video. Attention span, who watches it? The vendor, very important. Do you know, who else watches the whole thing multiple times, shares it with some other decision makers that are often behind the scenes? Are you competitors? <laughs> Neighbours. Neighbours. Well, by the way, this may be true. Your competitors watching it freaking out going, ah, oh, I want to do that but I'm too scared. What? Who said that? Exactly, thank you. Now this is the key. I would be a fan of doing it if the only person who watched it was the vendor and it was helpful to us. But I really go, what's the purpose of the video? To sell the property. To sell the property! So the key person to watch that video, I don't care if the thing only has 10 views as long as nine of them are the buyer. Yeah. Obviously we want more, great. But like, just recognize, even a private link to a video is better than no video for a buyer who's out of town and wants to take a look around. Or at least a FaceTime call or whatever else. Anyway, the buyer. So if you want some guidance as to the critical element, the purpose is sell. This is for a, this is by the way attention span for a property video. Do it to sell the property. Whatever you think is needed to sell the property, that's got to be your guiding light. You want to take some little snippets out of it, the real funny bits, the key moments that catch everyone else's attention, and put them out there, and then a link to the full video if you want to see more. Thirty minutes, thirty seconds, great. Abby, yours will be amazing, right? That's for you because <laughs> it's everyone else who's not really the buyer catch more attention, promote yourself, expose the property, do all the good things. But just remember the buyer who found it, who then you sent the link to, and they watched it, you've got the ability to speak directly to them. And I encourage you, if you can make sure that at least for a good point of your video, you've got a person in your mind that is the sort of buyer that's gonna buy it, a young family with kids and a dog. All right, boom, that's who I'm talking to. And just talk to that one buyer. Just imagine you're whispering in the air at auction, miss out on this one you're going to be hunting it's not very often you find a flat section just here without flooding issues or whatever it is right pretty much that really. <laughs> pretty rare <laughs> i don't know guys you know your craft talk to the buyer don't worry about it being three minutes long they'll watch the whole thing several times and share with their parents in the uk or whatever else uh, of course there's other facts to this uh, did that help yeah. love it could you give us a summary of the reasons why you feel option is so good? Like just a quick point yeah, yeah. summary? For sure. I'm going to imagine that I had the privilege to talk with one of your clients who's considering how to sell their house. Or maybe one of your clients is on the market currently and need to do something because it's just not worked yet. That's the hallucination I'm going to bring so that you can kind of hear how I might approach it. By the way, if you go, David, you are uh, you, I'm a bit different, I don't know all that stuff, it's, you know, it's not my style of talking, um, I'll just put it out there, if you think that it could be helpful to one of your clients, you're welcome to just tee up a little Zoom meeting. I'll often meet a client before they make a decision to go to auction. They won't always go to auction either, by the way, but it means you don't have to be the one that sells it to them, uh, and I'm just happy to tell the truth. So the, here's the thing, so if we were sitting down and you say, Mate, mate um, can you give us your perspective? By the way, let's set the scene. Maybe we're um, either at the listing table or maybe we've listed it already and now we're talking about our marketing options. Either one. By the way, Glenn Cortino, guy from Melbourne, auctioneer, used to be a business owner there, followed his kids over to Hollywood because they started to make it big in the music scene, sold RT Edgar, bought uh, Harcourt's Beverly Hills. Guess what? I think he must have called, would surely have been some of the very first property auctions in America. He said to me, Dave, you won't believe it, mate. These guys don't even know how to do auctions. I'm doing a terrible version, it sounds like they're working. <laughs> but, 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 uh, so it was kind of a blended approach. But you get the idea. They don't do auctions for property there. So he said, it's, I said, how do you convince people to sell by auction? He said, oh, quite carefully. I said, oh, great. Give me a bit more. He says, well, I just win the listing first, and then I sell auction. So, oh, that's not a silly idea. So if you're in a marketplace where vendors are not receptive to it, like 
By the way, you don't. This is uh, uh, full disclosure. I encourage you to be quite transparent. This is. It might sound like I'm encouraging you to, to, to keep something from the owner. Just simply like make sure that the first thing here is understand their situation, understand what they're trying to achieve. You will win the business, I'm sure, on your ability to help them navigate reality. Um, and then if you need to park the method of sale and come back to it, you say, look, do that. Anyway, so now you're talking method of sale, and I'll just say, hey, can I ask what's your previous real estate experience? You want to know what they already believe about selling property. This is the old negotiating manager. It's not about he who says the first number loses in a negotiation. It's he who has more information wins. And so it's good to get their side of the story. Because if that owner is someone who says to you, oh, you know what happened, blah, 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 the last time we were burned, etc., etc., auction, we hate it, we never go there, then it doesn't mean you can't take them to auction, but at least you're aware there's a bit of baggage here and you're not talking yourself out of a listing. So, first context to it. Now we're in the position, let's just imagine that they are not entirely closed-minded. I wouldn't talk auction unless you're having great success. Because, put it this way, if your perception of auction is that they're not working because they're not selling under the hammer, then I have to assume that your potential clients are feeling the same way about it. So you have to shift their attitude. Because if they think that success of an auction campaign is sell under the hammer, then they're never going to list it as an auction, are they? If that's, like, I, I'm just going off the success rates I've seen recently. By the way, good news for you, uh, South Auckland, first to fall, first to come back, I had an auction about three weeks ago with 19 bidders. So, yeah, halo effect, I'm sure it will come at some point, might be a lot longer, I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm talking to you, I'm imagining the market a year ago there, in the doldrums, right? So anyway, I'd go back, and this is what I'll probably say, so hey, look, my recommendation is that we, we approach this in a way that um, puts some urgency on our buyers with a deadline, because you wouldn't pay your phone bill if it didn't have a deadline, would you? Right, try and get a conversation going, got a deadline, all right? Uh, and also, we have seen some reasonably long chains of properties tied up and subject to sale, and wasted our owner's time, and then the money wasn't real because they couldn't sell what they thought they could get, or the finance falls over, or they, you know, builder comes through and actually there's an issue, and blah, blah, blah. So what, what we want to do is we want to try and put some levers in place to try to get people to make you an unconditional commitment. Uh, and then I'd also say we want to stimulate competition. We want to know, you know, that we have got the best out of the market, whether that be conditional or unconditional. How does that sound? What? Just, by the way, I, I don't think I've said the word auction, but am I talking about what auction does? Yeah. This is the whole thing, like, features tell, benefits sell. Old adage, very true. Tell them about the benefits, because that's what I see auction doing. I'll also tell them the truth. I'll say, look, you know what? If we price your home today, there's a big risk we get it wrong. Could be quite an expensive mistake because the best buyer for your property might see the price on your property and go and buy someone else's. And we don't even know. Or the other way, we sell it in one week and we think back and go, should, should we leave money on the table? So I'm, I'm nervous about putting a price out there in the first instance. Um, but if we don't put a price out there, I tell you what, unless there's a big red flag to a bull, we won't have much inquiry. So my recommendation is that we sell your motivation, give you a chance to make up your mind as to what a, a reasonable level is to exit the market, uh, and then give you the opportunity to do so really well. Is that helpful? Yes, it's, it's um, auction or deadline sale. Or oh, thank you so much, right? This is almost like with the vendor. I say, like, yeah, yeah, actually effectively what we do here is we run a deadline sale campaign and an auction campaign simultaneously. So what happens is we're going to identify all the interest in your property. We're just going to respectfully say to anyone who wants to make us an offer with conditions that, hey, we'd love to sell it to you. Our vendors have asked us to sell it unconditionally if at all possible. So why don't you just get your finance approved and why don't we get that builder through uh, and then you can bid at auction. Oh, no, no, I don't like auction. Hey, no worries. Well, why don't we just put an expression of interest to the owner so they at least know where your level is, and then who knows what they're going to do? Then you get feedback to seller. Here's some of the conditions, by the way, this is where they see your property. Like real feedback on price from a real buyer. Now the owner has more information, right? We also then go back to the buyer 
We did kind of warn them. Hey, look, thank you so much for your offer. I, I've got to say, like, vendors want to engage with it. However, they have said, we do want to sell unconditionally. So what I, what I suggest to you, like 100% if you're at auction and you're the best on the day, the owner's going to be talking to you. Or alternatively, happy to take your offer and we'll put it in an envelope and open it if it doesn't sell into the hammer. <coughs> Deadline sale at the same time as auction. How would you articulate to a landlord um, that we really have no freaking idea in this market what the costs were? Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, look, just tell them, like, I'm sure you have some war stories, right? I gotta say, this is to me. This is how the the market forces affect us and vendors. <coughs> Growth market. Guess what? You're always wrong on price. Boy, does it feel good. Yeah, true. Right? Is that true? True. Who sold a property above their appraised range while the market was going hot? <coughs> Who felt great about that? <laughs> good. But I just want to put a caveat there. Like, you helped, but that wasn't you. That was the market forces at play. Who sold a property for less than they appraised it, especially when the market turned, and felt a bit shitty about it? Pun mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah? That wasn't you. The owner sold the property. You helped. And you know what? If it was near the turn of the market, I bet they're glad they did. <laughs> so in terms of how we approach this with sellers, as, and I would literally say, I, see, I would tell you exactly what I would tell a seller. So you know what? We may have an educated guess at what we can sell your property for, but we are, especially in this market where it's very variable, often wrong. We're going to do our level-headed best to give you some good insight, to try and give you some confidence about where the market's likely to see your property. That's our appraisal. However, I'm nervous about hanging my hat on it. Like if I'm a core logic you know, degree of confidence, I'm dark red right now. So my suggestion to you is we take price out of the equation and give you a few weeks to get a real-time check on the market before you have to make a decision without losing any of those buyers, which you might if they made you an offer in week one. So what we do instead is we'll freeze the market for a few weeks while you think about it, and then you can make a decision with better information. By the way, freeze the market. First time I ever heard it working with a client, he loves auction. Uh, and he used to sell apartments. Uh, he told me a story in the Zest building. Does anyone know the Zest building in Auckland? Yeah. Right, cookie cutter apartments. I, I mean that just as it is, it's not a derogatory thing. There's lots of them that are very similar. Um, and he said he loved putting um, apartments to auction there because they'd freeze the market. You know, there might be five others just like it on the market and all the buyers would be yeah. to their property. And the other agents, and literally I know this is happening, a new client in Whangarei calls me, says, David, I hate auctions, but I think I might have to learn how to do them. I said, oh, what makes you say that? She said, oh, I'm being very frustrated at the moment. One of my competitors is doing a lot of auctions, and the buyers are saying they're just going to wait and see because they want to have a go at this one that's going to auction first. This is how I know it's in our vendor's interest. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. Could a deadline sale work the same way? I know you really like auction, and yeah. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, no. but could it be, I mean, most, most of the things, aside from the unconditional aspects, yeah. the deadline sale does the same? Yeah, you know what, I, I'm going to seem strange, but thank you very much for this. I am actually agnostic, because I think it's a little bit like a religion. You'll meet some people who are just like, auction's the way, the truth, and the life. Like, then, you're right? <laughs> uh, you heard me before, I genuinely think you can auction any property, and for me that would be my preferred method, but I see lots of successful salespeople who don't do auction, so I, like, I'm not, it's not cut and dry like that, but i tell you what I did notice, and in fact I'm going to tell you a story, I'm sure she won't mind, she's a lovely lady, um, Kathy May is her name, she's a client of mine in South Auckland, she used to do everything by auction, market turned, she went a bit patchy, then stopped getting bookings, she tried deadline, price by negotiation, putting a price on it, chasing the market down. She's come back to do auction again. In fact, she'd now be top auction agent in this particular business I do work with. Kathy's now swung full circle. She said she hated deadline because everyone just waited to the deadline. Yes. <laughs> and then it was just like starting the campaign three weeks late, struggled to get the interest through. I don't know the exact reasons for that, and maybe there could be some tweaks to deadline campaigns, by the way. You might, I, I, my hunch is, 
the same thing that works for auction. But I just think like if you're a buyer and you go mortgagee sale, auction, divorce, auction, uh, partnership dispute, auction. I think auction carries with it a little bit of a, we don't necessarily want to go down this path, but we have to. A little bit of like a, it's almost got a stigma to it. I know that's bizarre, but, and I said this to a client, I had a vendor meeting with someone, by the way, I do this if it's helpful to you through the campaign. I had a vendor meeting with a client, it was week one of their campaign, this guy was very angry. He says to me that I only had two groups through, the feedback was 900,000, the agents had appraised it at a million, get this, the sales team had viewed it, about 12 agents, feedback had been 850 to 900. So what does this owner think? He was, I'm sure that's what he thought. He didn't say it explicitly, but man, we had a little bit of a tough job um, and I was happy to help the salesperson with this, um, but it was tough because unfortunately that feedback had landed poorly. Uh, and anyway, I digress. But the key part is, I said to him, I said, mate, you know what, I've read your advert, there is not even a smidgen of urgency in your advert. I'm gonna say something to you that might insult you, it might sound like I'm trying to undersell your property, but I just want you to understand the auction dynamic. I said, I think you need to put some hint in there of some stress on your part, or at least that you're a bona fide seller. I said, may I ask, what is the reason for sale? He said, oh, we bought unconditionally in Tarot. I said, great. Would it be okay to put that in the advert? He goes, I don't know if that's a good idea. I said, well, it's totally up to you, but I think if you at least say that you put an offer and all that you're moving or something like that, that says, hello, market, I'm gonna sell, that you'll freeze the market because everyone will want to buy from you because they think that you're gonna be the one that's most prepared to meet the market. He goes, oh, I like that. Boom, advert changed. I don't know, this only happened last night. I'm willing to bet we get an uplifted activity. I also gave the agent a hard word about not just sending a written feedback thing through. You know, you've got to actually face people and, and make sure you understand how things are landing and be a bit empathetic and realize if you appraise it there and now you're giving low feedback, like that's not gonna be received well. Uh, and I also said to him, I said, how many buyers have you sent through this listing? She said, oh, just the ones through the open home. I said, well, you know, you're part of a big organization. Can you not go to the ones that have sold recently and talk to your colleague and beg Boris Steele, their open home register and call every buyer that went through the similar property and get them through the door? She goes, oh yeah, yeah, I can do that. I said, please, would you? So I'm hopeful, we'll see how things are. To me, that property's in triage at the moment. <laughs> but we'll see how we go. But to the story about deadline sale and how could you do it different, my instinct tells me, no price, deadline, okay, now put a red flag to the bull to make it seem like it's an urgent sale, has to be sold type thing and see if that helps you. Yeah. Yeah. The large majority of buyers that I've come across just like the price point negotiation. Absolutely. Yeah. No price. They want to know where it is. Yeah, and you mustn't give them one. Just because they want it doesn't mean you should give it. And if you quote price for the campaign, you'll either cap it or scare them off. That's just my thoughts. Um, I know we've got more questions. I actually have an option to call in 20 minutes. Uh, and love my time with you. Thank you for the questions. I know a few of you are following me down. We're going to head down and watch how we do a virtual auction. Um, I really am grateful. Thank you so much, Penny, Emma, Peter, the team for having me. I look forward to working with you. Cheers. Oh, good. Thanks, Lou. Right, we'll just play you the blooper video just for shits and giggles. It's worthwhile watching and recognising that uh, you don't have to be perfect and the great thing if you've got professional editors is you just do it until you're happy. And then guys, we're going to break for lunch.